Okay, another big issue with k-means is you have to know how many clusters you're looking for. Like, remember, remember, one of the inputs is k. So what if you don't? How can you determine the number of clusters in your data, which is typically a valid question? And uh, the sad answer is there isn't a good way to do that. So we have lots of uh, we have lots of machinery to try to do that, but none of it is really any good. <clears throat> Um, so, in some cases, you have natural values for k. So, for example, if my data was handwritten digits and I wanted to cluster that data, what is the natural number of clusters? What is the natural k value? 10, right? Because there are only 10 possible digits. So, if you have a situation like that, where you have a known number of clusters, classes in the data, that's what you should use as the number of clusters, right? Um, but what if you don't? What if you don't know anything about the data set? Well, uh, what could you do? Um, <clears throat> you could imagine running the k-means algorithm for different values of k, right? So set k equals to 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, run k-means and then see what kind of a variance you get and maybe optimize it that way, right? So you would do something like that. Cluster the data set into two, into three, into four, into five, <clears throat> and then uh, each time record the variance that you get and then see which variance is the best. So the problem is that is this is going to be optimized when k is equal to n, the number of instances in your data set. Can anyone see why? Yeah. Okay, so when you have as many clusters as data points, each centroid will happily migrate to its own individual data point. So each data point will end up in its own little cluster, and the distance from the data point to the cluster is going to be zero. Right? And you can't do better than zero when you're looking for variance. Right? <clears throat> and in general, the more, clusters you add, the more clusters you add to the system, the lower the variance is going to be. Okay, so we had this problem when we were talking about k and n. Remember, we talked about how do you pick the optimal value of k. And we said that, okay, if you do it stupidly, k equals 1 is always going to be optimal for k and n um, because you're doing it on a training data. And you remember we had a fix where we said, okay, but if we do it on the validation set, then we could actually pick a reasonable value of k. So can we do something similar here? Can we use a validation set and find find a reasonable value of k? Yes, no? Who thinks yes? Oh, come on. Who thinks no? All right. So the majority is correct. You cannot do it. So even if you do that, it is still going to be maximized when k is a really, really large number. So why is that? The way to think about it is now you're going to have two sets of points, right? So maybe these are our training points, and then on top of that, you know, think of these as validation sets, right? Uh, and then the centroids um, are the additional set of points. So you should be able to convince yourself that the more centroids you throw at it, even, though, even if those centroids don't correspond to these data points, the average variance is still going to go down and down and down. Because the more centroids you throw, the the more you will saturate the space with centroids. Right? So this is actually going to be optimized when you have an infinite uh, number of centroids. So that's not a very good solution either. Right? So uh, that's kind of a bummer. That was a useful tool in KNN, and it doesn't work here. Uh, <clears throat> so what do you do? Um, if you follow the book, the book advocates minimum description length, which is an interesting kind of trick to try to figure out what k is. And they say, well, rather than minimizing v, what you should do is you should minimize v plus the bits that you need to encode the k centroids. Right? And how you encode the k centroids, of course, that's highly specific. So how do you measure the number of bits? Um, that's, uh, uh, it's, there's, there's no single recipe. Um, there's a bigger problem with that, though. Uh, minimum description length, it's basically, it will give you a number which is not n and, and, and not 1. It'll give you some number in between. But that number is basically completely arbitrary. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't give good practical clustering. So it just gives a clustering that MDL thinks it's, is good. So if you believe that MDL is a great metric, uh, then yeah. Uh, then this will be a good clustering for you. So um, MDL is not a very good metric for many applications. So, um, so what, what else can you do? Um, 
Well, <clears throat> there is uh, typically what you do with a, um, in, in a situation like that is um, you select the number of clusters visually. So this plot, the plot of the variance going down as a function of the number of clusters, uh, by the way, the, the, the numbers here are off by one, so it should start with two. <clears throat> uh, so uh, this, is a scree, uh, this is called a scree plot, and the reason they call it a scree plot is if you sort of squint at it, you can imagine that this part, where the variance is dropping rapidly, um, sort of think of it as a mountain, like right? this is the side of the mountain, and this is the rubble that fell off from the mountain. Right? Think, in, think in terms of that analogy. And what you're looking for is you're looking for a point where the mountain ends and the rubble begins. Why are you looking for that point? The reason you're looking for that is up until that point, each cluster I add, I was getting a substantial decrease in the variance. And after that point, I'm getting marginal decreases in the variance. So this suggests that up until this point, I was finding big structural elements in my data. And after that point, I'm finding noise. I'm, I'm fitting noise, right? I'm, I'm taking a cluster like that, which is already pretty tight, you know, the, the, this little guy. And as I add more clusters, I'll split it into two, and then I'll split it into three. And you could argue that that's adding noise. You're not really adding anything useful um, at this point. So, um, so you select it visually. Um, if you are really unhappy with a visual selection out of it, or you want an automated procedure, uh, selecting this point is actually the same thing as picking out uh, maximizing the second derivative of the variance as a function of the number of clusters. So uh, if you think about what is the second derivative, well, first of all, what is the first derivative? So this is the variance itself. The first derivative is how much does the variance change as I add one more cluster? So it's just the difference between this and this and the difference between this and this. Right. And then the second derivative is how much do those differences change as I add another cluster? So, and if you think about it, so uh, here the difference, it went from 2.5 to 2, and here it went from 2 to maybe 1.3. Big changes, right? So the difference between here and here and here and here isn't that great. But here I had a big difference going from 2 to 1.3, and then I had something that went from 1.3 to 1.1. The difference between those is really massive. So that's what the second derivative picks out for you. So by taking the second derivative, you can kind of identify uh, this point where uh, where the um, where you you can interpret it as starting to fit uh, noise. You've you fitted the major major structural elements, and from this point on, uh, you, you're not going to get much change. <clears throat> so uh, these are all hacky and unsatisfactory ways to select the value of k, but there's nothing better. So that's the sad news.